A noise from outside the police station broke my concentration as I was working on my Sudoku puzzle. It sounded like a car horn, but louder. It stopped and started with an urgency indicating someone was trying to get attention. What the hell was that noise? Randy, my sheriff's deputy, asked from inside the holding cell. I saw the red lines on his face and realized he'd been sleeping in there, stretched out on one of the benches with an arm over his eyes to block the light, like a cat in a sunbeam. I don't know, I said, putting my puzzle book down. Sounds like they might need some help, though. I stood up and Randy reluctantly followed after me, heading towards the front door of the cop shop. When I stepped through the threshold, the sound immediately boomed ten times louder, and I saw what was making the noise. There was an enormous black tour bus stopped haphazardly in the middle of Main Street, and there was a woman standing at the wheel, pressing down on the horn with both hands and screaming at the top of her lungs. Help me! Help me! She yelled over and over again. Are you alright, miss? I asked, approaching the bus. The sound of the horn swallowed up my voice, and I tried again. Help! Won't someone please help me? Lady in distress! Lady in distress! Finally, she stopped long enough for me to sneak in another word. Hey! I yelled, and she stumbled backwards, right into the driver's side window, clearly caught by surprise. Oh my god! She shrieked, her hands going up to the sides of her face like a caricature of a scared person. They're gone! You have to help me! Bobby, Steve, Danny, Rebecca, they're all gone, all of them! Slow down, I said, stepping up onto the stairs of the bus. Talk to me. I'm here to help. I'm the sheriff of Hollow's End. This is my partner, Randy. Her eyes widened even further. You're the sheriff? Of course you're the sheriff. And you're the deputy, Randy. She trailed off, then smiled in a way which caught me off guard. It's so nice to meet both of you. I'm Sandy. She stuck out both hands to embrace mine and then shook vigorously. Uh, nice to meet you, too? I replied hesitantly. Now come inside, Sandy. Let's sort this out. They probably all just went for a cheeseburger or something. Were you taking a nap? Maybe they forgot about you. Randy scoffed loudly, and I wanted to smack him for it. Chances were that the people on the bus were in a fair bit of trouble. In fact, they were probably dead by now. But I didn't want to scare the woman any more than I had to. So tell me, from the beginning, what happened exactly? I asked once we were sitting down in the bullpen and the woman had a warm cup of tea in her hands. And what the fuck were you folks doing in Hollow's End in the first place? Randy asked with an edge to his voice. Let me guess, you're just passing through. Well, as a matter of fact, we were. Our bus was heading up towards New York City and the driver decided to take a shortcut. I was about to ask another question when Randy interjected. I see, so let me get this straight. You went through a town that's nowhere near any interstates, completely off the beaten path, and has been intentionally severed from all main thoroughfares for over a century because it's a shortcut. What the hell are you getting at, Randy? Hasn't she been through enough already? This woman is an innocent bystander. You can't be guilty if you're a bystander. That's the whole definition of a bystander. Wait a minute. Who are you taking your legal advice from, Jackie Childs? Have you been binned watching Seinfeld again? That's none of your business, Mr. Homeland. You wouldn't know good television if it bit you in the... You two are police officers? The woman screamed, standing up and spilling her tea on the floor. Stop bickering and just tell me something. How are we going to find my friends? That shut us both up, and we just stood there staring at each other hopelessly. Randy broke the silence, as he always did. All right, we'll help you. But I want you to know I'm not buying your shortcut story for one second. It's completely impractical. And I got an A- in grade 8 geography class, my partner said with false modesty, elbowing me in the ribs. A- minus. Why would you emphasize the minus part? Never mind. Randy, who would do this? Who would kidnap a tour bus full of people? What are we looking at here? Ancient curse? Subterraneans? Or just a low-key swamp monster smorgasbord? Well, those are all distinct possibilities. But to be honest, none of them really hit the mark for me. Usually tourists don't go missing in broad daylight in Hollow's Inn. Typically, they don't start getting sacrificed and decapitated until well after dark. So, something different might be at play here. Something weird. The woman just watched us the whole time while we were talking, her eyes darting back and forth between our faces as if she were watching a tennis match. 
By the end of this short conversation, I could see the amused smile on her face. Randy must have seen it too. Right there, he shouted, pointing at her face. The smile disappeared immediately. You are so busted! You know about Hall of Zan, don't you? You're here with one of those supernaturalist tours, aren't you? Didn't you guys learn after the last group disappeared? She bit her lip, then opened her mouth to speak, but Randy cut her off. I knew it! We just wanted to stop by the town for the morning. Maybe see the swamp. We were heading to Salem right afterwards, I swear. Bullshit. You got up at the ass crack of dawn, piled onto that bus with your cameras and your looky-loose selfie sticks, and you are gonna stay all fucking day and visit the fudge shop. And look, this is what happened to you. Well, we ain't helping you. Killing tourists is a proud tradition in Hollow's End. You knew that and still came here as a tourist. How stupid are you? If anything, you deserve to die. I grabbed Randy by the arm and pulled him away from the woman before he could say anything else incriminating. We didn't have body cams, but I could just imagine what this would look like on CNN if we did. Listen, you don't get to make these kinds of decisions. We don't get to choose who we help. We help anyone who comes within our jurisdiction, okay? And that includes this woman and her tour bus full of idiot friends, got it? He sulked for another few seconds before agreeing. Fine. But if we don't find him before dark, it's all fair game. I'm not even going to try anymore after 5 p.m. You know that's when I start working on my side hustle. Drinking and gambling are not side hustles. They're dangerous addictions. Eh, you wouldn't be saying that if you came out drinking and gambling with me every once in a while. I go with Muriel. We literally cannot lose. She's great at cheating. I am once again going to pretend I didn't hear that. So, what's the first stop? Swamp monster? Forest? Butcher shop? Oh, can we go see Swampy first? The woman asked, clapping her hands and bouncing up and down. I love Swampy. Swampy would eat your face and digest your mangled carcass for all eternity if he had the chance. But yeah, let's go see the big green bastard. Come on. Eee! Please stop that. We got to the swamp, and the woman immediately started trying to get out of the back of the cop car, complaining loudly when the door didn't open. Stay there, I said, getting out and hanging onto the car for balance. Randy exited on the other side of the car, and came around to my side, being careful not to slip. The entire parking lot was sloped down towards the swamp at an incredibly steep angle. No one was entirely sure, but that angle seemed to get more precarious by the day, as if Swampy were actually ingesting the parking lot, and perhaps reality itself. No one had gotten up the nerve to ask him to stop, so it kept getting worse. Hey, Swampy, Randy yelled. A single eyeball shot up on a stalk roughly the diameter of a drinking straw. It blinked a couple of times, and then a huge mouth opened up on the surface of the algae-covered pond. Hey, Randy, a booming voice called back. What's up? My partner elbowed me in the ribs, clearly not wanting to have to ask the hard questions. Hey, buddy. Uh, did you happen to see some tourists running around here today? Maybe, Swampy answered after several long moments. Did you, uh... Look, I'm not judging, because I know we owe you a favor and y you gotta eat. But did you happen to devour any of them? We're just trying to get a quick head count on how many can be rescued and how many to write off completely. For insurance purposes, y you know how it is. Good luck, Swampy said, and the eyeball and mouth suddenly disappeared. What the hell? Randy muttered. Swampy, come back, dude. We need to ask you a couple more questions. The surface of the swamp stayed still and unmoving. That's weird. What? It's almost like something's got him spooked, Randy said, looking at the swamp with his eyebrows furrowed. But that's impossible. What the hell could possibly scare a swamp monster? That guy is as big as a half dozen football fields and could eat a fucking dinosaur. What could he be scared of? Something caught my attention on the other side of the swamp. On the far shore, I saw a figure who appeared to have a very long neck, like a human giraffe. Who the fuck is that? I asked. Who? Long neck dude on the far shore. He a friend of yours? I asked Sandy but she looked just as confused as I felt, although she still had that glimmer of joy behind her eyes that I secretly distrusted and genuinely didn't like one bit. I've never seen that before, Sandy responded, her voice muffled by the window glass. Can you roll these down? It's getting real hot in here. Not one of ours, Randy added, ignoring her request. At least not one that I've met. I took a picture with my phone, but it ended up as a blurry, pixelated mess due to the distance involved. Really, it's incredibly hot in here. Can you please turn on the AC or something? 
So if he's not from Hollow's End and he's not from the tour bus, then who the hell is he? The long-necked man thing stood there looking at us for a few more long moments and then turned away, disappearing into the brush. He walked off and didn't reappear again. At least, not yet. We wouldn't see him again until later, and by then everything was completely fucked and it didn't really matter anymore. But at that moment it definitely seemed important. Probably because it was. Well, that definitely seems relevant, I said, trying to sound official. Let's pursue this lead, deputy. You got it, Sheriff. Sandy, it's been a pleasure, but you're on your own, he said, preparing to open the door and let the woman out, like letting a rehabilitated deer back into the wild after nursing it back to health. No, Randy, we gotta keep her safe. We can't just set her loose in the town for her to get disappeared like the rest of her friends. Why not, boss? Because that's our job, remember? Serve and protect? Oh, right. You're coming with us, miss. Deep into those dark, mysterious woods full of strange creatures that eat people. Is that better? No. Listen, Randy. I pulled him aside, hopefully out of earshot, as Sandy's eyes were growing wider and wider at our conversation. Where's the safest place in town? Think about it. No, man, come on. She'll wreck it. I've got it all set up just the way I like it. It's a bench and a stainless steel toilet. She can't wreck it. And I'm in charge, remember? Now, let's go break the bad news to her. I am not going to stay in a jail cell. I haven't done anything wrong. If I'm not under arrest, then I demand you let me go so I can follow you around. Sandy was saying, gripping the bars with both hands. I have rights. This is for your own protection, I said, locking the cage with my key. I still hadn't managed to get the spare key back from Randy, and had never gotten around to changing the lock. I tossed the key into the desk drawer, beside my old monkey paw and the spare ankle pistol. You'll love it in there, Randy said with a wink. Just think of it like a Hollow's End-themed hotel room. You could pretend to be me. Just don't drink any of my booze. We'll be back in a few hours, I promise. Probably. We left the bullpen to the sounds of her protests, which were silenced as I closed the door behind me. As we stepped out onto the street, I tried to figure out what to do next. That guy at the swamp, he didn't look human, Randy said. No shit, Sherlock. Now listen, hear me out. He didn't look like a monster, either. Usually people in town are one of the two, and he was neither one. So what are you saying? He's an alien? Exactly. And who can you think of around here is pretty much definitely an alien? My eyes widened with the realization, and the two of us said the same name at the same time. Then we got in the cruiser and began heading towards the grocery store. It was time to speak to one of the employees there. I had a feeling he would know something. Can I help you? A manager asked us as we were looking around the checkout area for a potential witness. I looked up and let out a startled yelp as I took in the face of a dog man from across from me. He was wearing a grocery store uniform with a name tag on his breast which read, Teddy Dog. Sorry about him, Randy said, looking at me with an annoyed glance. He's still getting used to the town. Newbies, am I right? Ugh, it's fine. You should see the looks I get from tourists. What's up, Sheriff? Actually, it's funny you should mention tourists. Uh, we seem to be missing a few of them. And? What's the problem? Exactly, Randy muttered. That's what I keep saying. The problem, gentlemen and gentle dog man, is that my job is to protect the people of this town, including the people who just come here for a friendly visit. Same as your job, Randy. Fucking boy scout over here. Now, if you just point us in the direction of one of your employees, we, we just have a few questions for him. I believe his name is Mark. From Earth, said a voice from behind us, and I looked back to see a man with oversized almond-shaped eyes, a curiously long neck, and no discernible nose looking at us from the produce section where he was stacking up a display of apples. Oh, his, his skin was also pale gray, which was, I guess, a little bit odd. Have fun, Teddy Dog said, walking away. I'm pretty sure he was laughing. Are you Mark? I asked the man. My full legal name is Mark from Earth, he said, placing a shiny apple on top of the pile where it stayed perfectly balanced. I see. Um, there's just a few questions we wanted to ask you, Mark from Earth. Do you know this... person? I held up my phone and showed him the picture. He leaned in closely and squinted at it and I could have sworn I saw his neck extend by several more inches, 
as if it were a measuring tape. It looks like a bad photo, said Mark from Earth. I would need to see the subject in more detail. Perhaps you should purchase a better phone. We were on the other side of the swamp, okay? And I'm not springing for a new frickin' phone every decade. That's called planned obsolescence, and it's how they get you. Regardless, the image you have presented is useless for diagnostic purposes. Do you have further inquiries, Sheriff? You are distracting me from my polished wax apple stacking duties. Great. Yeah, you've been super helpful. Ugh, let's go, Randy. We turned to walk away, and I thought of one more question. Hey, Mark? From Earth. Did you grow up here? I mean, were you born in Hollow's End, or did you move here, like, from somewhere else? He paused and looked at me strangely. I find that question offensive, he said, blinking his eyes 17 times in quick succession. It is the 21st century, Sheriff. We don't ask those kinds of questions anymore. If I am not under arrest, I would like to return to my polished wax apple stacking duties. Right, I said, turning around again. Makes sense. Have a good one, Mark from Earth. We left the store, and I immediately commented about the interaction to Randy. Anything about that seem off to you? You mean the fact that his neck was basically a push-pop, or that the dude is clearly an alien from another planet? Both of those things, Randy. Both of those things. Plus, he didn't seem to want to talk to us. I'll bet that thing we saw at the swamp was just another one of his kind. Another Mark from Earth just waiting to work at the grocery store. Or maybe the library, I don't know. Ah, fuck, man, we got nothing again. We're really bad at this. I couldn't argue with him about that. Uh, do you know anybody who's, like, better at this than we are? Maybe Muriel, or... I don't know. A newspaper was blowing in the wind and smacked into a telephone pole right next to me, opening up to reveal a page titled Horoscopes. This gave me an idea. Is there a psychic in town or somebody who can see the future? You guys have every other kind of strangeness here. Is that a crazy question to ask? Well, there's the Crimson Muse, Randy said after a moment of thought. But I don't know if she'd be interested in helping you save the lives of tourists. That's kind of a faux pas around here. Lead the way, Randy, I replied. What the hell else do we have going for us right now? When we arrived at the little hut on the outskirts of town... I saw a wisp of smoke rising from the chimney, indicating someone was home. A flickering light could be seen within as well, which looked like an old-fashioned kerosene lamp. This wasn't completely uncommon in town, as many people, and monsters, preferred to live off the grid entirely. Although a few of these supposed Luddites had been known to steal Wi-Fi signal and power from nearby neighbors, indicating perhaps they weren't quite as averse to technology as they would claim. The issue was more that they were cheap and preferred to receive these benefits for free. Few people argued when the one stealing your power or Wi-Fi was a 15-foot tall furry blue monster with teeth as long as railroad spikes, even if he was hogging your bandwidth. The two of us knocked on the front door of the little cabin and waited for an answer. Finally, after almost a minute, a woman with a friendly smile came to the door. She looked human at least, which was always a relief. You never knew what you were going to run into when you stepped into a new place in this town. Hello, are you here to see the Crimson Muse? She asked in a sing-song voice. I'm her assistant, Diane. You must be the new sheriff. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. I guess it's good we haven't had an opportunity to run into each other yet. <laughs> you must meet all sorts of troublemakers in your line of work. She was talking very loudly, and it seemed to me like maybe she was covering for her boss, perhaps giving her some extra time to hide evidence by distracting us long enough. I was kind of used to that at this point. Most people around here call me a narc behind my back, or... Some unkind and unsubtle variation on that. Apparently, despite saving the town and all of humanity, I was still an outsider around here. Untrustworthy. I played along with her. Oh yeah, plenty of unsavory characters in this town, that's for sure. We're thinking about putting Swampy behind bars next week. That guy's killed a lot of people, right? It's about time he paid for his crimes. Swampy? No. You can't do that. You wouldn't. Send the two, send them through. A woman was speaking from the shadows in the next room. I assumed it was the Crimson Muse. Her assistant looked slightly unsure and then finally nodded her head. That's right, nothing to hide. Just a regular psychic doing, um, palm readings and, um, 
Crystal ball things. She waved her hands around an imaginary crystal ball as she said this last part. Go, enter and see the crimson muse. We walked in slowly through a cloud of smoke being generated by a nearby machine. Red lights began to light up the space in strobing flashes. We're not customers, turn off the effects. Sorry. The smoke was still everywhere, but at least it had stopped filling the room. The flashing red lights had also mercifully ceased. Sheriff and his deputy, come inside and drink some tea. Take a seat and speak with me, a voice said from the shadows. You can come out of the shadows and talk to us, I said nervously. For some reason I was getting a very bad feeling, like standing in front of a hungry lion. Glancing over at Randy, I saw him shaking his head rapidly and making a cut-it-out gesture with a finger across his neck. Face to face? A tasty taste? The woman asked, and I thought it detected something different hidden in there. Something not entirely human. I was getting a little scared. Okay, who am I kidding? My knees were starting to shake and I was wishing I'd taken a leak before visiting this place. Because my bladder was about to let go just hearing that voice. Dude, shut the fuck up. You do not want to see the Crimson Muse face to face. Just ask your questions and let's get the fuck out of here. Randy whispered. He looked more scared than I'd ever seen him. And that includes the time we were almost murdered by spider people and a giant tentacle monster the size of a mountain. Uh, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, Crimson Muse. No need to, uh, come out here. Just stay in the shadows. That's, that's perfect with us. You have but one chance here, the voice said, again sounding not entirely human. You may only have one answer, and it may not be for what you asked today, but for what may lead another way. Great, I thought to myself. That's perfect. I guess she hasn't heard of obstruction of justice. Not that I was going to be the one to tell her about it. We gotta think carefully, Randy said. We only get one question. But she just said she wouldn't even answer that question. She'd answer a different one, right? Dude, you are so out of your element you're embarrassing yourself. Let me handle this. As much as I didn't want to do that, I thought I'd better let Randy take the lead. Hopefully I wouldn't regret it. What happened to all the people on the tour bus that came into Hollow's Inn today? Randy asked. People that there never were, of that the Crimson Muse is sure, she answered. Lies, deceits, half-truths she tell, as she all but ruins your jail cell. My apartment! Randy cursed, rushing out of the room and heading back to the car. I followed after him, yelling a thank you over my shoulder to Diane and the Crimson Muse. The two of us went back to the police station, hoping we'd find some answers when we arrived there. Unfortunately, all we got were more questions. When we opened the door to the bullpen, we found that the place had been ransacked. The cage door was hanging open, and the bench was gone, as well as the toilet. Water was leaking everywhere from the hole where it had been. Judging by the amount of water on the floor, I guessed it had been flooding like this for half an hour or more. My desk was hanging open with pry marks around the edges of the locked drawer. The keys to the jail cell were missing, as was Sandy. Worst of all, the monkey paw was gone, too. I told you she was gonna wreck it! Randy yelled, picking up the remains of his liquor bottles. And I'm pretty sure she drank some of my Grey Goose. I had to admit he'd been right. And so had the Crimson Muse. But we still weren't any closer to figuring out where that tour bus full of people had gone. Worse than that, now we had one more person to add to the list of missing people. Glancing down at my shoes soaked in toilet water, I shook my head. It was going to be a very, very long day. Well, ain't that some shit, Randy said, looking at the empty jail cell and the missing magical monkey paw. That broad must have superpowers and broke out of her cell, taking that toilet with her in case she needed it later. We better chase after her, boss. I tried to ignore the ridiculous nature of this probably true statement and examined the shattered remains of our bullpen. The place was in even worse shape than usual. There was water leaking all over the floor from the broken toilet, not to mention the potential chaos that a missing magic monkey paw could unleash. Still, it was probably safer than if Randy were holding it. You still have your monkey paw somewhere, right? I asked my deputy. Please tell me there aren't two of those things missing. I still got it. At least, I'm 
Pretty sure I do. It's locked up safe and sound at the motel. Mom's keeping an eye on it for me. Joy Burton was a sensible and disciplined woman, unlike her son, so I took that as a good sign that the other monkey paw was still safe. I considered what problem should be addressed first, and the practical side of me took over as I ran over to the water shutoff valve to turn it off, to prevent the place from being completely flooded with toilet water. What the hell are you doing, man? We got worse problems than leaky plumbing right now. Call Shark, he'll deal with it. By the time we get back, the cell and the whole place will be good as new. The guy's a wizard. For real? I asked, turning the knob to the water shutoff valve. Like, Gandalf? No, not really. That would be ridiculous. He's a plumber slash handyman. And he's also a shark person. Now come on, you turned off the water, now let's get the fuck out of here and catch that bitch. I ran after him, pulling out my cell phone to call Shark. Whoever the hell that was. Dialing zero, the phone connected me immediately to the town operator. Hello, Muriel speaking. How can I direct your call, sweetie? Muriel, it's the sheriff. I need to speak with Shark. Randy says he can fix the bullpen. It just got destroyed by some random lady. I think she might have superpowers. Oh dear, Muriel said, not sounding particularly concerned. I heard slot machines in the background and figured she was at the casino. I'm connecting you now. Have a great day, sweetie. Uh, we could actually really use some help, I started to say, but then heard a dial tone and realized she was long gone. This is Shark, a voice said a moment later. What is problem? Uh, sorry to bother you, I said, taken aback by his greeting. This is the sheriff. Forgive me if I've been interrupting, but I was told you can fix anything. Yes, like I say, what is problem? I fix. Oh. Uh, okay, here it is. There's this woman in the jail cell, and she she tore the place apart. Ripped out the toilet, stole a monkey paw, flooded the place pretty badly. Okay, I on it. You shut off water, I assuming? Yeah. Damn. Okay, give me hour. It'll be good as new. The line went dead as I got into the patrol car and started the engine. Randy was looking at me expectantly. Uh, he said to give him an hour and it'll be good as new. Cool. See, I told you. Let me guess. He wasn't happy you turned off the water, right? Y yeah, how'd you know? He likes to splash around in it. Shark people. They're kind of funny like that. They want to be on dry land amongst the people. But deep down, they're still sharkish. I put the car in drive and pulled into the street, steering around the oversized tour bus, which was still blocking half the road. Something about that bus was off, and made me want to investigate it further. But we didn't have time for that right now. We had a super-powered monkey-paw-wishing woman to catch. Where the hell are we going, Randy? I asked. We got people going missing again, and no fucking clue what's happening. The weird shit's ramping up just like last time, and I got a good feeling it's only going to get weirder. What the fuck are you smiling about over there? My deputy had an annoying grin on his face, which was growing wider by the second. Nothing, sorry. It's just, I used to have to deal with this stuff on my own. Hence the constant blackout drinking. It's nice not to be the only one freaking out when a new monster shows up or when people start disappearing. Plus, I like that you're technically in charge, so if something goes horribly wrong, everybody will totally blame you for it. Great. That's very heartwarming. Now, will you please tell me where the fuck we're going? As it turned out, he didn't have to. My cell phone rang, and I pulled it out to see who was calling. It was the grocery store. Hollows and Sheriff's Office, I said. What's your emergency? We're a little backed up right now. The gruff voice of Teddy Dog, the grocery store manager, answered back. Sheriff, you gotta come quick. Mark from Earth is missing. He went for his break and never came back. And there were signs of a scuffle. It looks like someone kidnapped him. Ah, oh, shit, not another one. Okay, we'll be right there. Er? I hung up, ignoring his Scooby-Doo-esque whine of confusion, and looked over to Randy, ready to explain everything to him. But he was fast asleep. When we arrived at the grocery store, the employees were all standing together in the produce section, having some sort of team meeting. We approached the group of them and overheard the last few moments of Teddy Dog's speech. Okay, remember, stay safe, everybody. If you're going to go on break or to your car, find your buddy. Take him with you. We're all concerned about Mark from Earth but he's probably going to be okay. So let's go back to work and let the sheriff and Randy handle this. He glanced over his shoulder and saw us coming, then wrapped it up. Okay, come find me if you have any questions or concerns. Cheryl, stay back for a second. 
I want you to tell them what you told me. A woman stayed back with the manager while the rest of the grocery store workers dispersed. When we got in front of Teddy Dog, he introduced us to her. Sheriff, this is Cheryl James. She works in the receiving department. Tell them what you saw, Cheryl. The woman looked nervous, staring at her shoes, but eventually her eyes met mine and she began to speak. Mark from Earth, he was... I saw him out in the parking lot. There were two men in black suits and they were forcing him into a white van. I tried to look for a license plate, but there weren't any. I saw his face. He looked scared. Real scared. Okay, I said, pulling up my trusty notepad. Other than black suits, do they have any identifying features? Height, hair color, skin color, tattoos, anything like that? She thought about this. Well, I'm not sure. You don't remember anything about them? Other than black suits, white van? She seemed to be searching her memory banks, but was coming up empty. No, nothing. It's weird. It's a bit like a dream. I can remember parts of it, but the rest slips away. Randy stepped between the two of us, giving me a I'll-handle-this sort of look. He produced a golden antique pocket watch on a chain, then began to dangle it in front of the woman's face like a hypnotist. All right, now listen here, ma'am. What you've most likely witnessed is a cadre of super-secret government agents, known in some circles as the Men in Black. They have high-tech alien weaponry and equipment that... Oh, like that movie with Will Smith, she interrupted. He's so handsome. Fuck! No! Not like that movie with Will Smith! These are horrible, brutal people we're talking about. They will erase your memories and are quite possibly demons wearing human skin to blend in. For real? Shh! Don't interrupt! Now, focus your attention on this watch. This gold pocket watch is the only thing which exists in the world. Let everything else melt away and just watch it slowly as it rocks gently back and forth. Randy's words were coming slower and slower, his voice becoming thick and difficult to understand. It took me several moments to realize that Randy was, in fact, asleep. He was still standing up, and the watch was still swinging back and forth like an off-kilter pendulum, but he was definitely out. Luckily, so was the woman. I waved my fingers in front of her face to double-check. Hey, miss? I asked. Hmm, yes, she said, her eyelids mostly closed, smacking her lips like someone in a dream eating sausages. No, not those ones. The spicy Italian, she mumbled, confirming my suspicions. Can you tell me a little bit more about those men in black suits who were shoving Mark from Earth into the back of that unmarked van? That depends, she said back. Are you going to share that, honey mustard? Or are you going to finish off the whole bottle yourself? After an uncomfortable amount of play acting involving pantomiming eating barbecue sausages, I managed to get a good bit of useful information out of the woman. After waking up Randy, we left the grocery store to track down the van. I punched the license plate numbers into the police cruiser's computer system, and it came back with a result a few moments later. According to the police network, the van's license plate belonged to a corporation, a large company called Proteon Technology, Inc. I couldn't find out much about them. They didn't even appear to have a website. It was like they didn't exist. Well, let's go check out that tour bus again, I said to Randy as we drove away from the grocery store. I've got a hunch... And I want to make sure I'm right about it before we do anything else. Sure thing, boss, Randy said. But after, can we stop by that sausage cart on Main Street? I got a hankering for some honey garlic all of a sudden. I rolled my eyes, but didn't argue. All that sausage talk had me getting hungry, too. We pulled up in front of the abandoned tour bus a few minutes later, and then got out of the cruiser. I led the way up the stairs of the bus and looked up and down the aisle for clues. I opened the overhead bins, checked seats for left-behind items, and searched the driver's area as well. Are you noticing anything strange about this bus? I asked Randy. No, looks pretty ordinary to me. In fact, this is all really boring. Look closer, Randy. Try to ignore your sausage cravings and really look. Do you see luggage, food, purses, water? Anything to indicate there was a tour group here earlier today? Slowly, his eyes grew wide. Ain't nothing here, he mumbled. There ain't nothing here. It's like... Almost as if that woman were the only passenger on the bus. Randy's face lit up. 
Yeah, what the hell? Why would she be on the bus by herself? This thing probably gets terrible gas mileage. If she was touring the country, she'd be better off driving a dump truck. Yeah, unless she wasn't actually on a tour. Think about it, Randy. That woman was lying to us from the get-go. She was a diversion, a distraction. And I've got a strong suspicion that company Proteon is behind all this. Maybe Mark from Earth was their target right from the start. Shit, Randy agreed. And we saw another one of those things down by the swamp. You think maybe these Proteon people are trying to round up all the aliens in Hollow Zand? Maybe to reverse engineer their advanced technology or some shit? I thought about this and decided it felt right. Or at least, close enough. Now we're getting somewhere, my friend. Now what do we do about it? Hmm. A super powerful mega corporation with unlimited resources is kidnapping residents from town. I think something like this might have happened before. Just give me a quick sec. He pulled out a folded card from his back pocket and read through it. Looks like we need to confront the maniac responsible and kill him. I'd recommend some reconnaissance first, though. Let's get the gang together and see if we can't flush this fucker out. He put the card back in his pocket. What is that? I asked, impossibly curious. Cheat cheat, he answered. I got it from the last sheriff. Any scenario we could be faced with, this thing has the answers. Can I see that? Sure, buddy. He handed it to me and I looked it over, my eyes growing as wide as saucers. Pretty cool, huh? He asked, clearly trying to impress me. Yeah, man. Really helpful. As I handed back the expired Wendy's coupons, I reminded myself that Randy was not mentally well, and was in fact truly insane. But that didn't mean he was always wrong, just most of the time. Okay, let's go find the son of a bitch and kill him. The CEO of Proteon has officially cashed his last check. Those words escaped my lips, and as soon as they did, the door of the tour bus closed, and I heard a sound like a heavy lock snapping into place. <laughs> you boys really have me all figured out, don't you? A voice said from hidden speakers all around us. Too bad you're all way too dumb to stop me. As green-tinted gas began to leak out from vents all around us, filling the bus with poison, I tried not to beat myself up too badly. Terrified as I was, I tried to stay calm. I tried to tell myself I would get through this. But as the laughter filled my ears and my vision went dark, the nightmares which entered my mind told me that would not be the case. A lot of towns, big and small, have thoughts about tourists. Most of those thoughts are not the kindest. Despite the fact that many of us have been tourists at some point or another, somewhere in our lives. In a random, for instance, town, a person might say, Don't bother with that place, it's only for tourists. A restaurant or an attraction might even gain the notorious moniker of being a tourist trap, which implies that only the stupidest of people could be roped into going there, and all locals clearly know better and avoid it at all costs. An ex-girlfriend of mine's uncle, used to insist that any and all stop signs in our old town were just for tourists. Until, of course, his fateful accident when he crashed into a school bus full of ice cream. It wasn't actually full of ice cream. The reality was far more tragic. It was full of illegal drugs. Anyways, Hollow's End has a saying about tourists as well. A saying that I frowned upon until yesterday. Now I agree 100%. Maybe not quite, but close to that. A solid 80% of me believes it now. Killing tourists is a proud tradition in Hollow's End. That's what I was told and I didn't believe it. But of course, like everything else in this backwards ass town, the truth is stranger than fiction. And it makes sense too, if, of course they'd kill tourists in a town full of magical creatures and folklore adjacent monsters who live like regular citizens. Otherwise those tourists will go home and tell other people to visit this place. And then it's all over. I'm not quite that far gone, yet. I'm not going to endorse killing tourists. But I have developed my own saying which I plan to use in situations like this should they present themselves in the future. Next time a tour bus full of people goes missing in Hollow's End, I plan on telling anyone who will listen, tourists aren't worth the trouble. Pretty catchy, huh? I'm going to say it real sassy-like too, so that people really get that there's a backstory, but they're going to have to pry it out of me with a drink or two. I think I get loaded pretty much for free that way. Man, what are you looking so wistful for? You know we're completely fucked, right? 
The voice of Randy, my deputy, spoke up next to me, breaking me from my pleasant thoughts. Why do you always have to interrupt my daydreams of getting wasted? I looked around and was immediately reminded of where we were, and why I was trying to distract myself from it. We were in a super high-tech prison-slash-laboratory from the looks of it, which reminded me of something a really fancy supervillain might build. Like Lex Luthor or Alex Jones or somebody like that. All around the enormous space I saw disconcerting things, one after another. Across from us, there was another cell with a blue-tinged force field preventing escape. I noticed there were no steel bars in this place. The control consoles, which allowed entry into these forbidden spaces, could only be accessed by retinal scan. I noticed as I saw a pair of guards bringing in an old lady and throwing her into a cell. Muriel! I called out, and my voice must have carried across the large room because she heard me clearly. The kind old woman who served as the town's unofficial mayor was being thrown roughly into a cell, but as her head rose and she met my eyes, I saw a resolve and a boiling anger there. These guys were fucked if she ever got out of that cell. I had no doubt. She called out a few curses, spitting on the force field and causing sparks to leap from its glowing blue facade. Muriel flinched backwards at that, and the guards snickered as they left her in the futuristic prison. It looks like they've managed to round up most of us, she said, looking around the room at all the familiar faces. We're running out of lifelines. All my phone friends are here. I saw she was right. In the cell next to mine was Butcher, the one guy who might have been able to save us from this mess. He was a giant, hulking beast of a man who looked like he was comprised of half a dozen people stitched together. His ever-present cleaver was missing, and he looked more angry than I'd ever seen him. But unfortunately, he was also chained to a wall with manacles that appeared to have been built for King Kong. Jay, the delivery guy, was in the cage beside Muriel, and next to our spot was a large cell filled with other town residents. Another corner of the room looked like it contained Mark from Earth, and several of his alien comrades. Their long necks made them look like a pack of pale flamingos, and their wide, scared eyes made me feel genuinely sorry for them. Crimson Muse and her assistant Diane were in another cell, and I tried not to look too long at the Crimson Muse, since I felt myself slowly losing sanity as I did so. Despite her power, even she had been contained, and I saw a swelling anger billing within the dark void of her existence. A pair of red eyes like embers glowing brighter by the moment. Most of the grocery store employees were in another cage, and I noticed Frank, the giant blue monster, had his own private accommodations, probably so he wouldn't eat anyone. Similar to the butcher, he was restrained against a wall with a set of thick steel manacles. No wonder Swampy was so quiet about everything earlier, I said. Even he's scared of these people. And for good reason, a familiar voice said. I looked up and saw it was Sandy, the tourist woman from the bus. She was standing outside the force field and looking in at us. She was the one who had started all this, but she looked different now. Her hair was tied back in a tight bun, and she wore a white lab coat and thick glasses. She was carrying a tablet in one hand and was tapping away at the touchscreen with her manicured fingers. Garrett is a genius, far beyond his time. You people really don't know what you're up against. It's almost not even fair. Randy's eye twitched as she came closer to us. He hated this woman even more than I did. What the hell do you want from us, lady? You think you can keep us locked up in here like frickin' zoo animals? She barely glanced up from the tablet, but I could see she wasn't concerned by anything we had to say. After a few moments of tapping at the screen, she looked at him again and spoke. My goodness, you really are simple, aren't you? I mean, I could have gathered as much from this one's writings, but he actually undersold it. Randy punched the glowing force field and was shocked with a high voltage that sent him reeling backwards. A moment later, he was shaking off his hand and blowing on it as if it were on fire. You bitch, he muttered. You fucking bitch, I'll kill you when I get out of here. Oh, come now, Randy. You don't mean that. We're going to become good friends, you and I. We'll have plenty of time to get to know each other. For the rest of your natural life, in fact. There are so many secrets to unlock within that simple head of yours. So much we can tap into and harness for our own purposes. You people don't understand what a blessing this town is. This place is like another world. And yet you live here as if it were an ordinary village. I was becoming more and more frightened by the moment. 
things were starting to come together for me. I suddenly knew roughly what was going on, and it didn't surprise me that much. Since moving to Hollow's End, I'd begun to develop what I was calling my sixth sense, essentially an ability to see certain things ahead of time, and to look into the future if I tried hard enough. I only wished I'd been trying harder to see the future a few days ago. These people were like the scientists in E.T. They had discovered a freakish, weird beauty. But instead of a Martian pet possessed by a little boy named Elliot, they had unearthed a bizarre town where people had superpowers, where monsters lived among humans. And now they were going to exploit this place for their own despicable purposes. But the worst part of it is, it was all my fault. I was the reason these people were here. Me sharing this town's existence online was enough to spur their interest, and with a multi-billion dollar company at their disposal, they'd managed to locate us. Despite the fact that I'd used a fake name for the town and I'd concealed every nearby landmark, still they'd found us. I hated myself at that moment, but I had to try to gain something from this woman who had taken so much from us. I needed to do something. I hoped that maybe she would be a fan of James Bond villain-esque exposition and would reveal her whole evil plot to us. You work for that company, don't you? I asked in my best attempt at a leading question. Proteon, that's it. That caught her attention, and she looked at me with something like admiration. Well, isn't that something? One of you isn't quite as stupid as he looks. Hey, I figured it out too, Randy shouted. He's not the only one who isn't as stupid as he looks, lady. So let me guess. You figured out that Hollow's End is a special place with monsters and magic, and now you're going to try to exploit that magic for your own gain, is that it? Sandy looked surprised. Magic? Well, isn't that something? We knew about the monsters, but the magic business was only a theory. Oh, thank you so much, Sheriff. You've once again been so helpful. Garrett will be delighted to know his suspicions were correct. Wait, I called after her as she sauntered away. Don't you want to reveal your whole evil plot to us? Or anything? A moment later, she was gone. I was left alone with Randy and the rest of the town residents who were staring daggers at me from all around. Nice one, dumbass, Randy muttered. Who the hell put you in charge? Then, under his breath, You're doing great, boss. Don't mind me. I'm just putting on a show for the cameras. You know, making it look like we're falling apart mentally. I might start doing some weird shit up in here. But just remember, it's all for the cameras. And with that, he curled up in the fetal position and began to weep like a baby. Part of me really felt like joining him. Over the following days, we settled into our captivity. The worst part was watching the Proteon scientists as they took us one by one from our holding cells, marching each citizen of Hollow's End to another part of the facility for questioning, or whatever they were doing. A few came back and spoke of intense interrogations, but others were never seen again. We don't even know if they're still alive. There was no rhyme or reason to who they pulled from the cages. One day it was an alien creature from the cage containing Mark from Earth and all of his friends. The next day it was a furry blue monster who looked like a smaller version of Frank. Once he was gone, Frank howled and thrashed in his cage, nearly tearing one of the steel manacles from the wall in the process. He was inconsolable afterwards. Part of me wonders if that creature was one of his offspring. Each day the Proteon people brought in more citizens from Hollow's End, throwing them into high-tech, futuristic jail cells. Jerome, the cable guy, must have been hiding out somewhere because it took them days to find him, but eventually he ended up in a cell with us. A few more folks were thrown into our cell as well, since we seemed to be the only one with space remaining. There was Pick Your Sticker, a humanoid creature who seemed more comfortable clinging to the walls and ceiling, hanging upside down to sleep at night. His fingers were wider on the pads in the end, reminding me a bit of a frog or a gecko from the rainforest. He wore a bandana over his mouth at all times, not even removing it to eat, making me wonder what was underneath. I pictured long, sharp teeth like a piranha. Another grocery store worker was thrown in with us as well. A woman named Mamacato with dimpled alligator green skin like an avocado. She told us Cheryl James was still hiding out somewhere, but that the town was looking more and more empty every day. Not only that, but there were other developments going on since we'd been captured. There are these trees popping up all over town. At first I didn't notice them, but now I can't stop seeing them everywhere. 
she said. They're growing fast. Overnight, they're twice the size of what they were yesterday. And they're covered in these bright red berries like nightshade plants. Weird, I said. Must have something to do with this company. This Garrett guy is up to no good. I just wish I knew what he was planning. What good would that do? Randy asked hopelessly. He was looking worse and worse by the day. We're stuck in here, dude. Might as well be on fucking Mars. There's nothing we can do to help, even if we did know what was happening. That same day, we got one more new prisoner, and the cell was suddenly overfilled. It was getting claustrophobic and difficult to breathe, but I introduced myself to him anyways, being as friendly as I could under the circumstances. Hey, I'm Sheriff Parsons, I said. I don't think we've met. The being in front of me almost didn't look alive. In fact, I realized it probably wasn't. It reminded me a bit of Data from Star Trek, an android that was almost human but not quite. Hello, Sheriff, the robotic-sounding voice said. I am Clue 404. I have been programmed to get you out of here. Aw, oh, hell yeah! Our own personal R2-D2 sent to rescue us, Randy said, jumping up from the bench where he'd been sitting, and looking a hell of a lot more excited than I'd seen him recently. Show us what you can do, little buddy. I'm ready. Give us a message from the princess. The android robot looked back and forth between the two of us. Then, smoke began to pour out from its nostrils. Overheating, overheating, overheating. Initiating sleep mode. Please use manual override key to reactivate life functions. And with that, the android closed its eyes and went to sleep. Of course, I thought to myself. Nothing ever fucking goes right in this town. Well, things have certainly gone from bad to worse around here. In case you need catching up, my deputy Randy and I were both kidnapped by an evil megacorporation CEO, who has been rounding up citizens from Hollow's End as if we were Pokemon cards. Not only that, but he's experimenting on us, testing our abilities and trying to exploit them for his own purposes. This morning, they took Randy away. To experiment on him or to interrogate him, I'm not sure but neither one would go well knowing him. I sat in shock for hours, unsure how to process it. I don't know if I'll ever see my deputy slash best friend again, and I'm already missing that drunken buffoon. The poor bastard howled like a dog as they pulled him from the cell, dragging his fingernails across the floor as they yanked him by both legs, tearing him away from us. It was a grisly scene. Now there's only a few of us left in here, Jerome, the town cable guy, is keeping busy trying to repair the android who said he was sent to rescue us, before he promptly overheated. Mamakado is sitting with Pick Your Sticker, trying to keep him calm. The poor guy clearly is used to being outdoors and not cooped up in a jail cell. His skin is looking slightly gray, and I'm a bit worried for him if we don't get him out of here soon. We've got nothing to do but sit back and wait for rescue, which got me thinking about Randy. The longer we waited for him to come back, the more I began to realize that he might never come back. They could be experimenting on him, or he could have said the wrong thing to the wrong person, and... No. I couldn't think about those things, even if they were highly probable. That would just make me feel discouraged. Instead, I tried to daydream, remembering some of the good times I'd had with Randy. When I couldn't think of one, I settled on a bad memory that turned out with a happy ending that time when my deputy saved my life. No, not the time you're thinking of. The other one. I haven't told you about this one yet. We were out patrolling Hollow's End. This was two or three weeks after the initial monkey paw incident, and we were still recovering from that. And I was still trying to convince Randy that we shouldn't use the damn things. Come on, boss. Just one time. We can wish for attack helicopters and fight each other with them. I ignored him and waited for him to determine for himself how bad of an idea this was. Yeah, you're right. Helicopter gas is way too expensive these days, he relented. As we were driving around town, I began to notice something strange. There were spider webs on almost every tree we passed by. Not just any regular sort of spider webs either. These were the ones made by orb spiders. As their name would suggest, the webs of these creatures resemble semi-transparent orbs which hang from the outer branches of trees. Typically when I drove around town, I might see three or four of these odd-looking spider webs. 
but on that particular day I was seeing them everywhere. Each house we drove past had the same spherical spider webs hanging from the trees. Just as I was about to mention this fact to Randy, someone flagged us down. I put the thought to the back of my mind, telling myself it was probably just a seasonal phenomenon. Everything all right, sir? I asked as I pulled to the side of the road. The man looked distraught. Downright panicked, actually. My son! He was playing in the backyard and now he's gone! He waited for us to follow him, and I put out a quick call on the radio to the volunteer fire department. If someone was available, they would come help us look for the boy. Luckily, a voice answered back on the radio. Who am I speaking to? I asked. This is Dante Kincaid, Hollow Zen Fire Department Chief. The man had a deep voice and sounded like he was serious about his job, even if it was just a volunteer position. I asked him if he could assist us in finding a missing boy, and without hesitation he told me he was on his way. The urgency in his voice reminded me that this was no ordinary town. If a child went missing, it could easily mean their death in a place like Hollow's End. Plenty of monsters who lived here were not very discerning about where their next meal came from. Hurry up, boss, Randy yelled from the gate leading into the backyard. You're going to want to see this. I ran over to join him and couldn't help but notice the number of orb spider nests lining the trees in this area. They were absolutely everywhere. As I got into the backyard, I realized why the nests were more common around here. This was where the mother of all orb spiders lived. There was a huge weeping willow tree at the back of the property, its leaves beginning to darken and turn orange in places with an early autumn hue. And hanging down from the largest branch near the bottom was a swollen, oversized orb spider nest. Like a bloated white postule about to burst, it hung there looking too large and round to exist. It had clearly been there for a while to grow this large, and I had no doubt that the other nests in this part of town were a result of this thing. Whatever spider had created it must have been massive. Holy shit, I muttered, and Randy overheard me. You got good eyes. I didn't think you'd see it from there. How could I not? It's obvious, isn't it? Randy marched straight towards the giant spider sack, getting far too close for my own personal comfort. Hey man, get back. It's not safe, I yelled. But he ignored me, reaching down to pick something up from the grass. Got it. Just a baseball cap, dude. Calm the fuck down. What's the big deal? He walked back towards me and handed me the baseball cap, acting as if there weren't a giant lacy spider ball the size of a Volkswagen behind him, the surface of it bulging and quivering with movement inside. I bet it belongs to the kid. Question is, what happened to him? The man who owned the house came back outside looking frantic. I called my wife. She's coming home from work right now. I just don't get it. He knows better than to run off like this. Looking distrustfully at the spider web out of the corner of my eye, I tried to act like a professional. Maybe this was just a normal thing in Hollow's End. Maybe the giant spiders were... friendly. Let's start from the beginning, sir, I said. What's your son's name, and yours as well, if you don't mind? I'm Zarin. My son's name is Devin. He was out in the backyard playing, and I just went inside for a second, and... How old is your son? Has he ever run off before? Never. He's only ten. I just don't understand what could have happened to him. Okay, great. And just one more question, I said, hoping he wouldn't say what I thought he was going to say. Do either of you see that giant oversized orb spider nest right there? He turned around, looked back at me, and shrugged. And you don't see it either, do you, Randy? What the fuck are you talking about, boss? Randy whispered to me, loud enough for the neighbors to hear. Mm, go figure. Okay, maybe it's because I've got some sort of true sight or something, but I can see a giant fucking spider web right there, like, just past where you found the hat. And I'll bet anything that those giant invisible spiders took your kids, Aaron. Where's the spider web? How am I missing this? He asked, squinting his eyes. Right there, I pointed. See? It's the size of a car, and there are things moving around inside of it. Oh, right. Yeah, I see it. I could tell he didn't see it. Okay, listen, please just head back inside. My deputy and I will go look for your son. I have a feeling he's still alive, but we gotta hurry. The man followed my orders and went up the steps, closing the door and locking it behind him. I saw his face peeking out through the little glass window in the door, watching us. You got a plan here, boss? Randy asked. Because for once, I am fresh out of ideas. I tried to ignore the obvious nature of the statement and proceeded to carefully walk towards the bulging spider sack which hung from the tree. 
So you don't see anything right here? I asked, outlining the shape of the spider web with my arms from a little ways away. Nah. Is it big? You're acting like it's big. It's the size of a fucking car, Randy. Weren't you listening? Yep, probably pretty big by the sounds of it. So what are we going to do, boss? The kid's dead, I'll bet. We should probably just leave. Look, I know you're scared of spiders since the whole monkey paw incident. But this is a little kid we're talking about here. We need to try to save him. Now, do you see any place around here that could potentially be used as a lair for a giant evil spider mama? Uh, nope. Randy said, his eyes telling me a different story. Back in the trees, a little ways away, there was a small cave. A muffled sound, which resembled a boy's cries for help, emanated from within, I realized as we got closer. Okay, he's gotta be in there, I said. We need weapons, something sharp. I grabbed a fallen branch from nearby and broke it over my knee. Luckily, it broke almost exactly in half, creating two smaller sticks that were jagged and sharp on one end. I handed one to Randy. It was almost like the universe was begging me to go through with this ridiculous and dangerous plan. Okay, let's go. Hopefully he's alone in there. Randy followed me into the darkness, muttering to himself under his breath. Hopefully he's alone in there. Why don't you just go say something else stupid like, everything's gonna be fine, or nothing could possibly go wrong. I turned on my cell phone flashlight and illuminated the blackened tunnel. It was still difficult to see somehow, as if this darkness were not created by a mere lack of light, but by some other sort of magic. It was like a shroud. A fog made of shadows. Shit, I don't like this, I said, taking another step deeper into the black mist. We probably shouldn't be breathing this stuff in. Randy didn't say anything from behind me. I took two more steps, feeling lightheaded, then saw a vague shape up ahead. It was a boy wrapped in spider webs dangling from the ceiling of the cave, and there was a massive spider spinning him around in circles, webbing him more and more with a spray of the stuff that shot from its gigantic ass. After two more steps, it saw us, and that giant spider actually grinned. Yep, the fucker grinned at me, and then I collapsed on the floor of the cave, still conscious but paralyzed. My body was tingling with pins and needles as I began to slide across the floor of the cave, something pulling me, dragging me forward. It was the giant spider. It was pulling me towards the center of its underground chamber. Then I felt myself rising into the air, being lifted up by my legs to dangle upside down, right beside the boy I was trying to rescue. Nice one, Devin muttered sarcastically from beside me where he was hanging. Great fucking rescue, dude. I couldn't argue with him. I'd fucked up royally, and as the spider began to spin me around in circles, wrapping me with webbing, I realized I was probably going to die because of my idiocy. Except Randy was nowhere to be seen. A spark of hope began to burn within me. Maybe he would save my life, just like he'd done before. Of course, you know he did, because I told you right at the start of all this that he was gonna, but let's just ignore that fact for a moment. You can probably imagine how scared I was, and it was clearly showing on my face since the ten-year-old kid next to me started trying to reassure me. Stop crying, we're gonna be okay, he said. My dad'll save us. I didn't have the heart to tell him that I'd sent his father inside, where he was likely hiding in a closet somewhere. His dad wasn't coming to rescue us. No one was. I'm coming, son, his father yelled through a gas mask, running into the midst of the cave to save us. Zarin turned out to be a badass after all, and he was accompanied by Randy and Dante, the town fire chief. The guy had shown up with a supply of gas masks and fire axes for the whole class. Randy had managed to escape the cave by cleverly letting me go ahead of him, and then leaving immediately once things started getting scary. He also had a high tolerance to toxins of all kinds due to his lifelong habit of consuming toxins of all kinds. Dante charged the giant spider, swinging his axe wildly as the creature bobbed and weaved. Despite its size, the thing was quick and deadly. It shot a spray of webbing at the fire chief, temporarily disabling him. It wrapped up his arms like a straitjacket. Randy came in swinging as the giant spider came in to bite Dante's face off. He swung his axe in a wide arc, cutting off the creature's front leg which was raised in the air. The monster screeched in pain, jettisoning black blood from its wounded appendage. Randy wasted no time taking another swing, this time at the creature's face. It reared backwards, but it was too late. 
His glancing blow caught the creature badly enough to slice its face down the middle, and cause it to slump to the ground, incapacitated. It was still writhing and squirming on its remaining legs, trying to move, but it couldn't even get up. I almost would have felt bad for the thing if it hadn't just tried to eat me. Zarin stepped forward. Allow me, he said, and finished the creature off with one swing of his axe. The blade lopped off the spider's head, and it rolled around for a few seconds before settling in a low spot on the cavern floor. Devin and I were cut down from our dangling prisms and dragged out into the fresh air. Within a few moments, I began to feel a prickling sensation returning to my fingertips and toes. Whatever gas had been present in the cave was created by that spider, used to paralyze its victims. But at least it was short-acting and didn't have any permanent effects. Hopefully. Well, that problem sorted itself out, Randy said, wiping spider guts off his axe blade by rubbing it against the grass. Do you mind if I keep this, by the way? He asked Dante. I bet I'd look cool as fuck killing things with it. Sure, go for it, the fire chief said, taking off his gas mask. You're lucky we showed up when we did, Sheriff. You really should be more cautious. Next time you see a black poisonous cloud of gas, maybe don't walk straight into it without respiratory equipment. Got it, I said, my face still down in the grass, my voice muffled by the ground. I was able to move some of my lower body now, at least. There was a tearing sound from nearby, and it took me about two seconds to figure out what had caused it. Ah, oh, shit. Please tell me somebody set fire to that invisible spider cocoon already, and that's not the sound of it tearing open and baby spiders pouring out. Screams could be heard all around, and I knew the answer to my question without anyone saying it. Why, oh why, do I always have to be the one to set the evil shit on fire? Miniature versions of the monster we just fought began to plop down on the grass, skittering in every direction. A few of them began heading straight towards me. I probably smelled like their mother, I realized, since there were chunks of her all over me. Once they got closer and realized they were deceived, they began to bite. Ow, fuck, ow, ow, somebody, ow, fuck, ow, help, ow! Surprisingly, it was the little boy who ran over to assist me, the one we had just been asked to rescue. Yeah, I know. It was embarrassing. Get back, Devin, it's not safe! He didn't even bother answering me, instead just using his powers. Apparently Devin was not just an ordinary kid. And I should have known that, since this is Hollow's End. He raised his hands up, and the air in front of them began to shimmer and turn hazy, and then it set a light. A gout of flames shot in my direction, and I winced backwards, feeling the heat of it as it burnt up the little spiders in front of me, turning them into ash. Burn, you little bastards! The boy yelled, and I was terrified as the red glow cast on his face from the flames made him look slightly demonic. Who knows, maybe he was a demon. I never bothered to ask. By the time it was all done and the spiders around us were all turned into crispy black shards, I was beginning to regain all feeling in my limbs. I stood up wobbly from where I'd been laying in the grass and looked around, feeling lightheaded and nauseated. You okay, boss? Randy asked, emerging from a grouping of nearby trees where he'd been hiding. Yeah, just great, Randy, I said. Thanks for saving my life, by the way. Again. Yeah, I know, again. I'm going to get you back for it one of these days, though. And you can count on that, my drunken friend. Uh, who's drunk? Zarin asked, pulling his boy closer. You've been drinking? Aren't you police officers? I sat in the futuristic jail cell remembering those good times, if you can call them that, and I felt more and more morose. Muriel was right. There was nobody left in Hollow's End to save us. All our best chances at rescue were locked up in this prison right beside us, waiting to be experimented on by Proteon or worse. Our only hope is that someone else can come through for us. Someone I've never met. And that sounds about as likely as Spider-Man bursting through the ceiling and saving us. Despite how fucking awesome that would be, I don't see it happening anytime soon. I'm signing off for now. Before I say anything else, I'll regret. I've already given Proteon enough information they can use against us. My best bet is radio silence from here on out. So this is it for now. My last transmission. At least, until someone can rescue us. Or if by some slim chance we can save ourselves. If you're out there, Spider-Man, Hollow's End needs your help. And it would be poetic justice, too, considering all the mutant spider bullshit we're constantly dealing with around here. Alright, 
stay safe, everyone. Keep us in your thoughts and prayers, and whatever you do, don't visit Hollow's End right now. There's no sheriff to protect you anymore. Not that we were very good at it in the first place. Psst. Hey, folks, it's me, Randy. Coming to you from the deep, dark, shit-stained bowels at the center of Proteon Corporation's Mega Prism. If you're new to Hollow's End and you're confused by what you just heard, well, you're not the only one. In fact, some people might argue that makes you saner than I am. Now, if you're interested in losing that sanity and learning more about this weird fucking town I live in and what makes it tick, well, there's a few videos that might help. They'll be in a playlist at the bottom of your screen on the right. If you want to skip all that and hear about the sheriff and how things got started getting sour the minute he showed up in town, well, you can click the video on the top right of your screen. Not yet. Sorry. Be patient. YouTube doesn't let us put them there until the last 10 seconds of the video. Oh, and in the meantime, there's a whole bunch of people I want to thank for helping to support Hall's End and all of its twisted endeavors and doomed enterprises. If you want to chip in and help support the town, well, you can be a citizen here just like the folks you're seeing on screen right now. You might recognize a few of their names from the story you just heard. Visit patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror or look in the description below to find out more. Alright, that's it for now. Hopefully somebody will come rescue us soon, because the prison food here is terrible, and the supply of liquor is about as low shelf as it gets. Prisoner 21908, put that down. That's hand sanitizer. You're not supposed to drink that. It's for hygiene purposes only. Okay, spoil sport. Well, so long, folks. I'll see you when I see you. Until then, steer clear of Hollow's End. Ain't nobody here to save you if you come visit. The sheriff's office is closed. Like I said before, click the link up top on the right for the sheriff's origin story. Or the playlist on the bottom right for all the hollows and you can handle. Good night, folks. Hopefully we'll see you again real soon.